Good morning, and welcome to the second day of VACMA's second annual Virginia Farmers Market Food Safety Summit. I'm Kim Hutchinson. I'm the Executive Director of the Virginia Farmers Market Association. The goal of the summit is to give farmers market managers and vendors the information they need to know about food safety requirements in Virginia. We are extremely grateful to the Virginia Department of Health, the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the Virginia Cooperative Extension, the Virginia Family Nutrition Program, and the Virginia Alcohol Beverage and Control Authority for their partnership on this event. I would also like to thank the USDA, Farm Credit, Virginia State University, Prince Charitable Trust, Virginia Fresh Match, Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers, and Farmers Market University for their support of VAFMA and Virginia Farmers Markets. Today, we are recording each presenter and will share those recordings as well as links to the resources they share. These videos and slides will be posted in the next two weeks and an email will go out when they are posted. We have shared all of the questions you submitted with our presenters. Please today use the Q&A box, not the chat feature, the Q&A box for any additional questions that you may have. We will collect the questions and answers and we will send out all of that information along with all of the videos, the slide decks, the presentations, uh, after the webinar. Um, a note about the proof of participation certificates. These are only being offered for the first day of the summit, not for the second or third days. If you attended our first day last week live and would like a proof of attendance, we will drop the link in the chat where you can request a certificate. We will verify that you did attend and we'll email you a certificate by the end of next week. If you are watching the recording now, you can still get proof of participation by taking the quiz, and we will have that available through Farmers Market University. Farmers Market University is an online platform we launched recently. It currently hosts multiple trainings for farmers market managers, including Market Management 101 and 201. We will be adding vendor trainings in the coming months as well. You can find out more at farmersmarketuniversity.org. All of the recordings will be available there as an automated quiz based on questions presented by our uh, sponsored by our presenters today. If you pass the quiz, a certificate will be emailed to you. Just aside from the certificates, I have loved seeing so many of you posting your certificates on your tents at your market. It reinforces to shoppers that you take food safety very seriously. The Virginia Farmers Market Association, or VAPMA, is a membership organization whose mission is to support farmers markets through education, networking, advocacy, and innovation that supports the growth and sustainability of farmers markets statewide. If you find our trainings and resources valuable, we encourage you to consider becoming a member or donating to VAFMA today. There is a link in the chat box with more information. So on with what we are here for today. Today, we're gonna to hear from VDAC speakers on three topics, dairy, CBD and hemp, and pet food. First, we're gonna hear from Hunter Moyer, the program supervisor for dairy services at VDAC. Next, we're going to hear from Lisa Ramsey, the Interim Program Manager of the Office of Hemp Enforcement from VDAX. And finally, we're going to hear from Carolyn Wilkinson, Agriculture Commodities Program Team Leader, VDAX, on pet food requirements for farmers markets. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it over to Hunter Moyer, Program Supervisor for Dairy Services with VDAX. Hunter, take it away. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Hunter Moyer. I'm the VDAX Dairy Services Program Supervisor. Today, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about uh, what, what our program does to keep your dairy utterly safe. Uh, I know it's early in the morning. I know it's a bad pun. Uh, first off, I want to give credit to our team of inspectors. Some of them are incredible photographers, and every last one of these pictures is taken on a farm in Virginia of Virginia-produced products or of our field inspectors performing their duties. Uh, our requirements to sell at farmer's markets are really simple since there's not a whole lot of exemptions when it comes to dairy products. So I'm going to start with a program overview about, and then the, go into the steps of the dairy production process and then finish up with farmer's market information. So who are we? Uh, I'm program supervisor. I oversee the program as a whole. I act as a liaison between outside agencies such as the Virginia Department of Health and the, and the United States Food and Drug Administration as well as industry organizations. I work to update rules and regulations, explain interpretations, and I also tend to administrative tasks such as our program's budget. We have an assistant program supervisor who's my right-hand man. He oversees inspector activities, both remotely and in the field, assists with rules interpretation, and takes the lead on label reviews. 
Uh, next up, we have our program support tech. Uh, she is the backbone of our program. Her primary function is data entry, permit issuances, ensuring that sample results, as well as any enforcement notifications are mailed in a timely fashion to producers and manufacturers. And lastly, we have nine dairy inspectors. They are the eyes and ears for the industry within the Commonwealth. They collect inspections, perform sample collections, and ultimately, they're the ones that enforce the dairy laws and regulations to maintain compliance and ensure safe and wholesome dairy products for all of our consumers. Now, our nine dairy inspectors encompass the entire state. Some of their regions are quite large. You will, however, notice that we have one inspector who has literally half of one county. And that is because this is where our grade A dairy farms are located. Over half of them are located in Rockingham. Uh, this map also shows where our VDAX labs are. We utilize these labs for our uh, finished product samples, raw milk samples, and water samples. And now this map does not include our cheese, butter, and ice cream manufacturers. Those are mostly situated in Northern Virginia and Eastern Virginia. Here's some real quick Virginia dairy facts. You can see that 90% of the milk produced in Virginia was consumed in the form of fluid milk. The top three milk producing counties are Rockingham, Pennsylvania, and Augusta counties. Dairy cow costs about $1,500 each. And Virginia has an average herd size of about 186 cows uh, there's about 70,000 cows total here in the state, and each of those cows will produce about eight gallons of milk a day. I'll give you a few more seconds if you want to read the rest of the material here. <clears throat> All right, so what do we do? By far, the biggest part of our program is inspection and sampling. When issues arise with this inspections and sampling, such as uh, repeat physical violations or repeated violative product samples, we have to enforce the rules and regulations we have in place to provide safe and wholesome products for our consumers. So to help mitigate these enforcement penalties, we provide equipment and label reviews as well as consultations. So our consultations will include all things dairy related from uh, what type of bedding to use for your animals to what type of steel should be used in your pipeline uh, and how that welding should be performed. We help determine the best type of chemicals to use for cleaning and sanitizing your facility. We'll also help troubleshoot quality problems in raw milk or finished products. Part of our mission is to also promote and foster the dairy industry in whatever we do and to educate about the industry wherever we go. Uh, so if you'll see, this is one of our dairy inspectors teaching a class of school children about some of the milk and water sampling that we perform. So milk and dairy products are some of the most highly regulated and the safest foods in the nation. Uh, you will notice my asterisk there. But we're not including raw milk in that statement. I'm sure that everyone here has heard that milk is one of nature's most perfect foods. It absolutely is. Uh, it is extremely nutritional for humans and also, unfortunately, for bad germs and bacteria such as listeria. You'll see that Virginia has five dairy-related regulations. These include the grade A regulations, cooling, storing, sampling, and transporting of milk regulations, ice cream and frozen dessert regulations, regulations for pay-purpose laboratories, and finally, the uh, regulations for milk for manufacturing purposes. Now, this regulation includes all of our standards for cheese and butter facilities. Both our grade A and our cooling and storing regulations have incorporated the 2017 Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, or as we refer to it as the PMO. And the PMO is a set of minimum standards and requirements that are established by the FDA for regulating the production, processing, and packaging of grade A milk. PMO lays out what to look for in inspections and how often to do them, how to test and verify pasteurization equipment, and establishes raw and finished product sampling frequencies and minimum quality standards. Believe it or not, many of the standards that we use in dairy, especially when it comes to equipment design and cleanability, are the same standards that many pharmaceutical drug manufacturing companies use to comply with their own regulations. Now, the first step on our journey today is going to be where it all starts, at the farm. We currently have about 350 grade A farms to include 23 fully automated robotic milking facilities. We have about 18 manufactured grade farms. Now, a grade A farm is going to be your typical dairy that produces milk that's going to be pasteurized and bottled, whereas your manufactured grade dairies are going to be most of our producer processors, where that milk is collected, made into cheese or butter or ice cream right there at the farm itself. Additionally, grade A raw milk can be transported across state lines for any use. Manufactured grade raw milk, though, may only cross state lines if it's going to be used for manufactured grade dairy products. When I say manufactured grade, that would be cheese, butter, ice cream, or your most typical ones. We inspect each farm a minimum of twice a year, and there's 83 things we look at on each inspection. We also sample the water every two years to check for the presence of coliforms and or E. coli. 
Our inspections include the construction and cleanliness of the milking parlor, the milking equipment, and the milk house. We observe the cleanliness of the animals in their housing environment. We make sure that hand washing and toilet facilities are in good working order. We're checking the surroundings of the farm and the milk house to make sure there's no harbages for rodents or flies. And we're also making sure that the milk has adequate protection from contamination. Um, on a physical level, this would be making sure that no hay or sawdust is found in the milk. On a biological level, it's ensuring that filters are in place to keep things like mastitis and other debris that may come, come off of an animal during the milking process, keep that from going into the bulk milk tank. And on a chemical level, we're making sure we have physical breaks for many chemical connections that are needed for cleaning while milking is in progress. Like I said, we sample water every two years for private wells, and every four to six months, we sample raw milk for semantic cell counts and standard plate counts, as well as for antibiotic residues. Now, somatic cells are nothing more than white blood cells. They give us an understanding of the general health of the herd or the animal, and the standard plate count is a way of counting the amount of bacteria found in the sample. Uh, this is most often an indicator of how well the milking system or other parts of equipment are being cleaned. Now, most states simply follow the federal PMO standards for somatic cells and standard plate count. However, a few years ago, our Virginia State Dairymen's Association decided that our grade A farmers should prove to the nation and kind of in one sense to the world, uh, how good of a product they can produce. So they put in a petition for rulemaking with VDAX to help achieve that. And as you can see, Virginia's quality standards are much stricter than the federal limits. And Virginia now produces some of the highest quality grade A milk in the nation. Our somatic cell count limit was cut by a quarter million and the limit for standard plate count was halved. Uh, cows and other dairy animals are given antibiotics for the same reason that people are, such as to fight off an infection or to potentially save a life. However, we don't want any type of our antibiotics in our food chain because of the potential of causing harm to individuals that are allergic to certain antibiotics. And also the dairy industry as a whole has always wanted to mitigate antimicrobial resistance. Um, raw milk has been officially screened for antibiotics for decades now. And each year, the amount of milk that does test positive for antibiotics declines. As of last year's study, only seven thousandths of 1% of the total raw milk supply in the nation was found to contain antibiotic residues. Uh, none of that milk ever enters the human food supply. As a matter of fact, it's mandatory that all milk must be tested prior to pasteurization, and any milk testing positive for residues must be disposed of in a manner so that it would not come back into the human food supply. Not to mention the farmer who's implicated for that adulteration has to pay all the other farmers for their contribution of that tanker load of milk, which can be between five and 8,000 gallons. For somatic cell count and standard plate count, we have a three-strike system for enforcement. If two of your last four sample results are volatile, we issue a letter of warning. If three of the last five are over the limit, your permit is suspended, and you cannot sell any more milk until your accounts are back within the legal standard. Uh, if your milk tests positive for antibiotics, however, your permit is immediately suspended, and you can't sell any more milk until your supply has tested negative again. Lastly, we also test for radiological compounds for farms that are within a certain radius of our nuclear power plants here. Uh, we can also test for aflatoxins, and we can also screen for tuberculosis and brucellosis if needed. So as I said earlier, um, antibiotic testing is a huge deal in the dairy industry, and it has been for, for many, many, many decades. We found this old inspection report on a farm about a year ago, and if you'll read it, you'll notice a few things. First off, the producer was suspended the day after his sample was taken from the inspector because it was adulterated with antibiotic residues. Now we have technology that can detect residues within 15 minutes or less. But the 24 hour turnaround back in 1974 was incredible. Also note the time the inspector went out to serve the suspension, which was 9.30 at night. Uh, we take these types of residues extremely seriously and we always have. Lastly, you'll see that the farmer had to dump all the milk that was produced from the time that the sample was collected, which is about 300 gallon jugs worth. Since antibiotic residues cause an immediate permit suspension, all the milk produced in the meantime was basically produced without a permit and therefore unsaleable. The producer would have to continue to lose milk until his sample came back as negative for antibiotic residues. Uh, before I move on, I also want to bring your attention to the bottom of the inspection sheet. And it says to contact your inspector prior to installing equipment or altering construction of facilities. I will get to why that's so important a little bit later on. Uh, that actually, that statement remains on all of our materials to this day. So with the exception of producer processors, most milk in Virginia is sold through a milk marketing cooperative, and that is in order to achieve the best price for a farmer's milk. That co-op will decide what plant to send the milk to, 
who's going to pick it up and when they're going to pick it up. And that way that farmer can focus on their farm and their herd. So now we've milked the animals. How does the milk get off the farm? Well, before the milk leaves the farm, a sample has to be taken from each bulk milk tank. This sample will be used to check the quality and the temperature of the milk and to make sure that there are no antibiotic residues once it arrives at the plant. Our haulers are evaluated on their pickup and sampling procedures to make sure they don't contaminate the milk. Part of their evaluation includes ensuring proper hand washing, proper sampling technique, proper sanitizing of any dippers, valves, or other pieces of equipment used, proper labeling of the sample, and proper storage of the sample itself during transport to the plant or laboratory. Since milk is such a perfect food for any organism, that milk in the bulk milk tanks has to be agitated consistently and refrigerated immediately to prevent any unwanted bacterial growth. Uh, these tanks are equipped with multiple ways of assuring that the milk is rapidly cooled from the 100 degrees that it leaves the animal from to less than 40 degrees within a couple of hours and then maintained there. We've got over 250 permitted bulk milk hauler samplers right now in the state. They're evaluated every year and a half. Uh, each evaluation, we're looking at 50 different things. Uh, and proper regulatory training is critical for these guys direct because their samples will directly affect what the producer is paid for their milk. So not only will the plant look at those uh, samples to determine if they can accept the milk, but then their co-op is also going to look at those samples and the producer can make premiums on good quality milk. But if the hauler contaminates the milk, that producer is going to see a ding in his paycheck. Now, since it's on the producer, who has to maintain the milk to below 40 degrees at the farm level, we also want to make sure it stays that cold all the way to the plant. So after that hauler is done sampling, the milk is then pumped into specially designed milk transport tankers that are designed to keep milk cold for prolonged periods of time uh, while in transit from the farm to the plant. Some of the things we look at during inspections, inspections of these tankers include proper tamper-proof seals to protect the milk from contamination or intentional adulteration, which has happened, uh, we check for properly filled out shipping manifests and sample vials. We look at the exterior and the interior condition of the, uh, the tank shell and the inner liner. We're checking out any and all filters, O-rings, gaskets, sanitizer containers, anything like that, and making sure that those pieces of equipment are also properly protected from contamination. We've got just under 100 tankers that are under inspection right now. Uh, they get inspected on an annual basis, looking at 33 different things on each one. We also have four dedicated standalone tank wash facilities and one transfer station. Those also have their own set of requirements and they are inspected every six months. All right, once the milk is delivered to the plant where it's destined to be pasteurized, it undergoes another series of quality checks before it can be offloaded. First off, it's illegal for a plant to accept any load of milk that is over 45 degrees or that tests positive for antibiotics. Additionally, the plant can reject loads based on their own quality standards, such as butterfat content. They may have more stringent somatic cell counter standard plate count uh, standards. They can reject it on temperature. We have one plant that will only take loads if they come in at 37 degrees or below. Um, they can also test for cryoscope, which is a test to determine the freezing point of milk, um, which is interesting. Milk is actually 87% water to begin with. Um, in Virginia, we've got 16 grade A uh, processing plants. They're inspected quarterly. Uh, their pasteurization equipment is also checked and sealed by regulatory authorities on a quarterly basis. Water is sampled every six months. Once again, four out of six months, we're taking finished product samples. Uh, they we're looking at coliform, standard plate count, checking again for antibiotic residues, and we're also looking for phosphatase. Phosphatase is a naturally occurring enzyme in milk, and it will be deactivated upon proper pasteurization. So if we ever do get a sample that comes up uh, positive for phosphatase, it has the potential to cause a pretty big recall. Now, every state in the nation has a milk program. Some of them are housed within the Department of Health. Some of them are housed within the Department of Agriculture. Uh, there are two states in the nation where it is portions of the milk program are in both agencies, and Virginia is one of those. So in Virginia, uh, the Department of Health will oversee grade A fluid processing plants and grade A products, such as yogurt, sour cream, cottage cheese, uh, through an MOU with VDAX. So now that we've talked about fluid milk and pasteurization and all that, what else can we do with it? So after the milk is pasteurized, it can be turned into all types of fun stuff, one of which is ice cream. Now, Dairy Services inspects two different types of ice cream and frozen dessert facilities. We inspect manufacturing plants where the mix is actually made and pasteurized, and we inspect those facilities that purchase a pre-made mix 
add their own inclusions and flavorings, and then wholesale their finished product. Uh, VDAX Food Safety will inspect facilities that sell their ice cream products at retail. Some of the things we look at are equipment construction, uh, making sure that floors, walls, and ceilings are in good repair and cleanable, washing and sanitation procedures, proper labeling of finished product, uh, making sure you've got adequate hand washing and toilet facilities. Definitely gonna go over pasteurization and storage records, road control records. We may also look at food safety plans. You'll notice two ice cream plants get inspected on a quarterly basis. Um, pasteurizer, if you're using them, those are gonna be checked on a quarterly basis. Four of every six months, we're taking finished product samples, checking for coliform, bacteria, phosphatase. We can also screen for uh, pathogens. And for ice cream, we will also run fats and solids. And that is because ice cream has a federal standard of identity, which dictates that in order to call your product ice cream, it has to have a minimum of 10% milk fat. So if your product only has 9% milk fat, you cannot call it ice cream. Uh, that's where we would tell you to call it frozen dessert. <clears throat> Another interesting thing is that we don't differentiate for frozen desserts whether it contains dairy or not. If you're wholesaling a frozen dessert, it could be a vegan popsicle. It's going to fall to dairy services. Next up, we've got our cheese and butter manufacturers. Uh, their inspection and sampling frequency is pretty much the same as with our ice cream plants. Once again, we're looking at equipment and facility maintenance and construction, hygienic equipment design, uh, proper washing and sanitation procedures, proper labeling of your products, proper uh, pasteurization chart reviews. So looking for things, once again, proper rodent control, no foods being consumed uh, in a processing area while production's underway. And also that you're operating with a safe and suitable water and boiler supply system. As with our ice cream manufacturers, we also will try to assist them with food safety plans as applicable. Uh, you see, we've got 44 cheese and butter manufacturers right now in the state. For cheese and butter, we will always, on a quarterly basis, check for Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli 0157, and Listeria. Uh, we can also test for Staph aureus or coliform. And you know, if, if applicable, we'll test for antibiotic residues. So cheese can be made from either pasteurized milk or it can be properly aged raw milk, which is above 35 degrees for a minimum of 60 days or whatever minimum number of days is specified under the standard of identity for that variety of cheese. If a cheese has a standard of identity, it has to follow that standard of identity or it cannot be called that name. For example, mozzarella can only be made from cow's milk or water buffalo milk. If it comes from goat milk, you can't call it mozzarella. You can call it a mozzarella style goat cheese. You can call it goatzarella. Uh, the same also goes for certain aging requirements for uh, certain cheeses. We'll take an example here, gorgonzola. Uh, to call your product gorgonzola, it's gotta be aged for a minimum of 90 days. If you only age it for 60, you can't call it gorgonzola. You can call it a gorgonzola style cheese. You can make up a name, call it garganzola or something like that. Uh, we do have small scale cheese plants here in our state. Uh, that, basically means your facility is small enough that it cannot process more than 50 gallons at a time, or let's say you're only making properly aged raw milk cheeses. And if you are small scale, you would be exempt from certain regulations in hopes to bring more small artisanal cheesemakers on board. Uh, Virginia is very unique in this. And some of these ex exemptions include the requirement for antibiotic residue testing, uh, dressing room and locker facilities, concrete or asphalt driveways, a fully equipped laboratory, drinking water facilities for employees, separate rooms for different operations, such as culturing, wrapping, and curing, and the requirement that hoops and presses may only be made from stainless steel. For example, we would allow more economically feasible food-grade plastics to be used by a small-scale producer than a large-scale producer. Uh, the reason we exempt the requirement of antibiotic testing in milk used in cheese is that the cheese won't properly set if there's antibiotics in the milk. Those antibiotics will actually kill or prevent the growth of the bacteria needed to make the product, so you won't be able to make any cheese to begin with. <clears throat> but we really do respect our cheesemakers here in Virginia. They're very hardworking. Uh, is, cheese making is truly an art. It's very difficult and time consuming, and you need a lot of milk to get a little bit of cheese. All right, touch a bit more on some of the other program, uh, other things that our program does. So the picture on the left is a 50 plus cow rotary parlor recently installed in Virginia. This is one of those parlors where the cows get on and it goes like a carousel. Uh, there is a lot of stainless steel pipeline and literal tons of steel, rubber and plastic product contact surfaces. All of those have very specific requirements that have to be met 
Uh, and this most often requires a lot of physical inspection throughout the duration of any construction project. For something like this, we're checking to see if we have sanitary wells that are fully penetrated and properly polished. We look at the proper velocity and the slugging of the CIP system. What components of your facility are CIPable? And what components have to be taken out, manually disassembled, and cleaned out of place? Um, what are your metals made of? Do they have a 32 micro inch surface roughness average? What's your vacuum pressure look like for your milking inflations? Are the seals on any centrifugal or positive displacement pumps leaking? If you have a heat exchanger, uh, do any of your plates exhibit fouling? If you uh, have thermometers, are they at the right place recording the proper temperature within the proper calibrations on the recording charts? Is everything sloped to drain? If you have a robotic milking facility, is it following the correct automatic teat preparation protocol for each particular manufacturer? I know probably none of that made any sense and that is absolutely fine. Um, that is why we do our consultations in order to help our permit holders stay in compliance with the multitude of rules and regulations concerning dairy. We understand that, that our producers and our manufacturers, they are trying to run a business and we're just trying to help them make sure that they stay within the rules and regulations. Um, there's literally, when it comes to dairy, thousands of pages of regulations, standards, interpretations, uh, specifications concerning anything in the dairy industry. The absolute last thing that we want to see happen is for someone to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a piece of equipment because they didn't let us look at it first and we have to deny it because it's made of an unacceptable grade of stainless steel where it's got poor uneven welds or it could be something as simple as a threaded bolt in a product contact zone. Um, once again, for label review, we're checking to make sure that our net weight statement is properly written and spaced, verifying the list of ingredients is in order of descending weight, making sure the name of the product is accurately described and within the correct font and type size parameters. We're double checking to make sure allergens are properly listed and also looking at some of the more obscure requirements, such as uh, if there's any intervening material between the ingredient list and the manufacturer or distributor information. As I said previously, we also try to promote and foster the dairy industry in whatever we do. And we educate about the industry everywhere we go. These Petri film plates on the right-hand side of the screen are actually samples of ice cream uh, that had high bacteria counts. And we were assisting the manufacturer to find out where in, the, in their process that the problem lied. Each of those little dots is actually a, a bacteria colony forming unit. So we do we do really try hard to help our producers and manufacturers out before we come in guns and blazing with regulatory. Um, so how do I prepare to sell at a farmer's market? First off, you have to be permitted by either VDAX Dairy Services or the Department of Health, depending on what product you're selling. Uh, it doesn't really matter where what state you're from. Dell, pretty much every dairy product is going to be, um, we always say hyper-regulated, so it's going to have a permit. Um, so even if you're within, if you're from West Virginia or Maryland or Pennsylvania, you're still going to need a permit. That permit has to be in good standing. Uh, there cannot be any active recalls for the products being sold at the market. New products, especially in Virginia with cheese, has to be sampled and held back from sale until results are received back as negative for pathogenic growth and within other safe regulatory levels. Once you're at the farmer's market, things are really simple. Almost all dairy products are considered a time temperature control for safety food. There's a few exemptions such as shelf stable aseptically processed fluid milk or like dried powdered milk, that's about it. So everything's gotta be refrigerated 41 degrees or below. If you're gonna take it out of refrigeration, it's gotta be either sold, served or destroyed within four hours. And that goes for free samples too. All right, so what dairy products can't you sell? In Virginia, uh, the sale of unpasteurized milk for human consumption is prohibited. Uh, no person may offer to sell or sell, barter, trade, or accept any goods or services in exchange for unpasteurized milk if the unpasteurized milk is intended for human consumption. A recent CDC study concluded that the consumption of raw milk is at least 150 times more likely to make a person ill when compared to the consumption of pasteurized milk. And raw and pasteurized milk, just like raw chicken or raw meat, has certain inherent risks no matter how well it is handled until it reaches a kill step, such as pasteurization. Uh, milk has been regulated for more than a century nationwide because of those inherent risks and food safety concerns. In older states like Virginia, uh, laws, policies, procedures, et cetera, concerning the handling of raw milk and the pasteurization of that milk have been around even longer. 
Uh, you also cannot sell any dairy products that are made without a permit. To, to sell any type of dairy product, you have to have a permit. To have a permit, you have to be inspected and you have to be sampled. If you are a farmer's market manager and you're going through your vendor applications, uh, how do you know if, if your vendor is permitted to sell dairy products? Well, it's easy. You can just email us at dairyservices at vdex.virginia.gov. Uh, I, for one, monitor that email every day. We can answer any questions you might have about particular dairy vendors either here within the state or also uh, the dairy industry as a whole is a very tight-knit community. It's no different when it comes to regulatory professionals in other states. Uh, just ask me, you know, if you've got a vendor from Maryland or Pennsylvania or North Carolina, I'll contact their program manager, make sure their permit's good to go and get back to you and give you the A-OK. -okay. Wrap it up. So just want to always remember to thank a farmer, doesn't matter what kind. This beautiful picture was taken on a very frosty morning in Abingdon by one of our inspectors. And then uh, I guess I can take some questions unless we're saving them for the end. <laughs> Thank you, Hunter. Um, I had one question and you went by the sl the last slide pretty quickly. Can you talk a little bit about the regulations around homemade ice cream um, and it being sold at market if it's made at home um, in a commissary kitchen or a restaurant facility? What are the requirements in order to be able to sell it at market? So for ice cream, uh, if you are wholesaling your ice cream, you have to be permitted with uh, dairy services with us. Now, if you were just retailing it, you I would suggest you talk to the VDAX Food Safety because we kind of separated those duties several years back. So now we're, we're dairy services only gets involved if it's wholesale. Okay. All right. And let me see if we have any other questions regarding dairy. Um, the only other question we have regarding dairy, and this may be more for insurance or an attorney, but um, we have uh, folks that are always trying to sell raw milk at farmers markets and the farmers markets turn them down and then they're trying to sell herd shares. You know, we, we refer them to sell herd shares, et cetera. Um, so one of the market managers has asked once she has turned down that person, if she knows that that farm is still selling raw milk for human consumption, does she have any other liability? If she, is there anything else that she is a responsible citizen should do regarding this farm that's illegally selling um, raw milk, besides turning them down from being able to sell at her market. So if they're actively selling raw milk and have absolutely zero attempt at making it through a herd share contract, I would highly encourage you to reach out to us here at Dairy Services and we will send somebody over there. Uh, you know, herd shares in Virginia, very, um, you know, they're not expressly prohibited or allowed, um, but, but raw milk for sale just as a point of sale transaction is definitely prohibited. Okay. Uh, what are the requirements for freeze dry and ice cream made by a permitted producer? I don't know if we have, I don't know if we at Dairy Services would have any requirements for freeze drying it. I'm honestly not very familiar with that process. I don't think we have any permitted producers who are doing that right now. However, food safety may. So they would fall under, I know they, Freeze drying any type of food falls under VDEX food safety. Um, but where you're concerned, if it's ice cream or any kind of a frozen beverage and they're freeze driving it, that does not fall under you. Not unless it would be wholesale. And then we may have to look at it on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, so if it's wholesale, then you would need to. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure whether this vendor does wholesale or they just do retail. All right. And then we have a question about honey butter where they're making honey butter, but the butter is being bought at a grocery store. What so his, historically, we have not, uh, we've always passed honey butter to food safety. Now yeah. that could change based on recipe formulations, uh, the amount of total protein from derived from milk, some of that stuff. Um, if there's any question, we would like to, to once again, look at that, look at the recipe and the formulations and then, determine a course of action from there. But historically, honey butter has always fallen under food. We would we would basically do the butter itself, you know, if it fell under us, but any manipulation thereafter would most likely fall to food. Okay. So back to raw milk. <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> well, we knew this was all that this would be the question. Um, raw milk with inspection, is that legal to sell at a farmer's market? No. No, I didn't think so. Okay. So you cannot sell raw milk at a farmer's market, period. No. A lot of people will claim um that you know they'll sell raw milk and they'll say it's permitted as a grade A, you know, it's grade A or some permitted through us. Uh, but our permits, they're grade A raw milk for pasteurization is what the permit actually says. So I would hope that anybody who is selling raw milk is not trying to pass off a VDAX permit saying that we're okay with that. Um, that is not the case. Okay. If you have someone wanting to buy raw goat milk for soap making only, is there an exception for that? We, we would only be involved for human consumption. Only for human consumption. Okay. Um, let me see. Oh, how does non-dairy items, how do non-dairy items work regarding uh, your department, such as vegan butter, cream cheese, et cetera? So if it's not a frozen dessert, we would, we would, we would only, we would not be involved with it. And now if it is a frozen dessert and it's being wholesaled, then yes, it would fall to us. But if it's a, a vegan cheese or imitation cheese or anything like that, that would actually not, that would fall to food. Okay. So anything imitation like vegan butter or vegan cheese, et cetera, would fall under food safety at VDAX. Correct. As milk in it it falls under you or milk fat um if a vendor is selling goat cheese out of a cooler is the vendor required to have the cheese on ice or use freeze packs yes so they would have to maintain that below 41 degrees 41 degrees okay all right and we and have no objection to coolers as long as it's being kept you know cold at 41 degrees okay um all right, that sounds great. We're going to capture all of your answers that uh, from the questions here. Are there any last questions for Hunter? Feel free to drop any additional questions into the chat and we will um, make sure that we get those answers. And Hunter, I thank you so much. As you know, raw milk is probably one of the, anything that has to do with raw milk and getting around it is by far one of the biggest questions that we get regarding farmer's markets. So basically raw milk, no. If it's for human consumption, for pets, yes. <laughs> That's my understanding. <laughs> we have another presenter who can cover that one. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I thank you so much. Oh, wait, I have one more for you before I let you go. Um, what are the regulations on a vendor selling prepackaged cheese that they do not make? Uh, if there's no manipulation or and it's still in the original packaging, I don't see where that would come under us. Now, if a retailer or anybody is buying cheese, let's say they're buying it from Walmart, and then they're cutting it into smaller pieces or smoking it or something, and they're reworking it or repackaging it, especially, or putting their own label on it, that would. But if they're just being a, you know, I guess, a, I don't want to say middleman, but if they're just not altering the product in any way, I don't see where that would fall under our rules or regulations. And it would still have to be within the original packaging and labeling? That's correct. Once, okay. it, once anything gets repackaged, the way our regulations read is... If it's repacked or reworked, it, it automatically comes to us. Okay. Uh, who from dairy services uh, works with farmer's markets regarding the questions and inspections and things of that sort? So we would we don't have anybody dedicated as like an outreach person, but I would most likely defer uh, any farmer's market to, you can talk to me or, or our assistant program supervisor, or most likely the, uh, the inspector in that region, probably their first point of contact. Okay. And I know that um, Hunter is most helpful and very responsive. We appreciate it. I always feel like everybody cringes when they see the word VAFMA come across their email, but y'all are great at answering all of our questions. Um, keep dropping your questions into the chat box. We will get those answered. Hunter, I don't know if you um, have the ability to stick around for a little bit and answer the questions that are in the chat box. I would appreciate that um, so that we can get your uh, get your specific answers. And we will make sure that everybody has Hunter's email address, as well as send out his presentation, et cetera. So Hunter, thank you so much for 
um, sharing all the information on dairy services today. And we thank you for all that you do. As somebody that grew up on a dairy farm, I really appreciate all you do to make sure that they still have the ability to sell in Virginia. So thank you. Um, so that was a great presentation and we got lots of information on what we can do and what we can't do regarding cheese and butter and raw milk um, and milk as a whole. So I really appreciate that. Next, we're going to hear all about um, the new hemp and CBD regulations. And we're going to hear from Lisa Ramsey, who is the Interim Program Manager, the Office of Hemp Enforcement with VDAX. Obviously, this is such a huge issue in Virginia that um, things have changed since our Food Safety Summit last year with VDAX and that they now have an entire, um, they've brought on uh, Lisa to oversee all of the new uh, regulations regarding hemp and CBD. So um, I thank you so much for being with us today, Lisa, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, good morning, and let me let me work on sharing my screen. And while she's doing that, just a quick reminder, everybody drop your questions in the chat, and we will be answering those, and I will ask her at the end of her presentation. Thank you. In the Q&A, please. I'm sorry, that's right, in the Q&A, not in the chat. Do not put your questions in the chat. Put them in the Q&A. Thank you. <clears throat> Does this look like it's sharing properly? <clears throat> it looks good. Okay, great. So um, there is a lot to say about hemp and CBD. <clears throat> and to tell you everything there is to know about it would take way more than what time we have here. So I've decided to focus just mostly on the laws themselves and the requirements for selling uh, products that contain hemp extract. And I thought I would start with uh, what caused us to be to this place, which was the 2018 USDA Farm Bill. Uh, and just to go over a little bit about that, um, the Farm Bill in 2018 did authorize the production of hemp uh, throughout the United States and uh, removed hemp from the Drug Enforcement Administration Schedule of Controlled Substances. Uh, following the enactment of the Farm Bill, there was a regulatory framework for commercial production of hemp and many states uh, developed their programs, modeled them after the USDA program. Virginia was one that did that same thing. So once Virginia developed their regulatory framework for production of uh, industrial hemp, uh, in July of 2019, the VDAX Food Safety Program uh, was at that time told to treat hemp extracts intended for human consumption as a food or food ingredient. And this was before we had any um, laws or regulations or anything to guide us in how to treat these ingredients, these new ingredients in food. And so we had to really think very hard about what kind of food safety hazards there would be, you know, what kind of requirements we would need to put in place to ensure food safety and to make sure that they uh, were producing an ingredient that we would feel comfortable allowing to be in food. So that was quite an interesting process, especially when we had no federal guidelines to, uh, to go by like we do with other food products. For example, with manufactured foods, we have the framework set by the um, Food and Drug Administration. Their regulatory programs for food manufacturing is what Virginia's laws and regulations are for manufactured foods. But for adding these ingredients, there was nothing to go on other than what various other states had done prior to us. And so we did look a lot at other states that had already gone down this road with allowing hemp extract in foods and tried to get information from those laws and regulations that other states had to try to put together reasonable uh, policies to have in place for allowing hemp extract to be in food in Virginia. And so we acted on po policy all the way from July 2019 until 2020, when we had a new section of law added to our Virginia food and drink law, which did put into law that industrial hemp could be a legal food or food ingredient in Virginia. And that new law in 2020 also outlined basic requirements for hemp extract when used in food. And then in 2022, we finally had regulations in place that governed the manufacturing sale of products containing hemp extract. Uh, the way it normally works with laws and regulations is the laws or like the over 
arching outline of what the requirements are, and then will normally give more details on what will be required by that law. So uh, regulations are normally in support of what the law says and do further expand what the intentions of the law are. So in 2022, we finally had the regulations in place instead of just a policy to operate on, and we began uh, regulating based on those uh, regulations in 2022. And then in 2023, in July of 2023, we had a new set of laws put in place, which made some significant changes to how we were regulating hemp extract in food. Those changes that were enacted in 2023 were a result of many food products throughout the state being sold that were lookalike products. Uh, they were candies and snacks typically consumed by children that had high amounts of intoxicating cannabinoids or you know, compounds from hemp extract in the products. Uh, this doesn't mean that all manufacturers were making bad products. There were a lot of good manufacturers across Virginia and across the United States in general, but the numbers of manufacturers of these uh, products that look like kids, candies and snacks, there were a lot of them and they were everywhere and they were coming from unknown or unapproved sources. And it was a huge problem. There were many calls to poison centers, people going to emergency rooms from taking products or from using products that they had no idea what was in the products. And so it was a, a huge problem in Virginia. And the lawmakers uh, that developed these regulations, but these new laws, they had that first and foremost in their minds. And so they tried to put together some laws that would uh, rein in some of that stuff we had going on in Virginia that was sending people to call, that was prompting people to call poison control centers and, you know, getting into the hands of kids. They were taking these products to schools. But anyway, the, the news laws came into place in 2023, and there were some very significant changes to the laws uh, in July of 2023. And I'm going to go over some of that today and try to give you an overview of what the requirements are. And there's no way that I'm going to be able to tell you everything that you need to know if you're going to sell these products. So, you know, at the end of this slideshow, there will be contact information and, and you can certainly ask your questions either in the question answer thing. Uh, Megan Music is very good at answering these questions because she and I worked together when it was initially, when we were initially told to allow these products to be in food. Megan Music and I worked very closely together when I was in food safety. And then I retired from food safety and came back to help specifically about hemp extract in foods. So um, today is not the only opportunity you'll have to get your questions answered. I thought I would start here too with just a little bit, a very little bit about cannabis sativa. Uh, cannabis sativa is the plant. Both hemp and marijuana are the plant cannabis sativa. And the difference between hemp and marijuana is really more a matter of law versus a matter of the biology of the plant. Uh, it's related to the amount of THC in the plant. On the federal level, if you have less than 0.3% delta-9 THC by dry weight, then that can be considered uh, hemp or industrial hemp. Industrial hemp is the phrase that's in law. We just short it, shorten it down to hemp. Uh, when, the pro when the plant material has greater than 0.3% THC by dry weight, that is by federal law marijuana. The Virginia laws enacted in 2023 added new requirements for products to meet to be considered hemp in Virginia. And uh, this was kind of a, a big change. And uh, we're going to talk about that next. In Virginia, uh, not only must the product not exceed 0.3% total uh, or delta 9 THC. In Virginia, we have we we have another definition for total THC in Virginia than most other states have. In Virginia, the meaning of total THC means all THC in a product that combines the weights of any delta 9 THC present plus any isomers of delta 9 THC, which could include delta 8 THC, delta 10, delta 6, and there could be some others out there, but those are the main ones that you may see for sale in products. The weights of all those isomers of uh, 
THC are combined together. And then on top of that, potential THC that would be included in THCA. And I don't know how many of you are involved in hemp, but the question about the legality of THCA is a question that I'm answering at least once a week, sometimes more than that a week. We're not regulating the smokable flour yet or the vaping products yet, but we are actively regulating edible hemp products. And you don't find a lot of products with THCA in it, but there are a few out there. But as we do move towards regulating products that are smokable flour, you do need, do need to understand that THCA is included within the total THC. And there is a multiplication factor because THCA does way more than uh, it's uh, the other compound that it becomes once it converts to THC. So we have to multiply that times a factor of 0 0.877 and then add that weight back to the other weights of THC in the product. And if all that combined together exceeds 0.3% in Virginia, then it is, uh, it's not industrial hemp. And when a product is not industrial hemp and it's, uh, it comes from cannabis, then it's, if it's not industrial hemp, then it's going to be marijuana. So the laws in Virginia don't outright say that uh, marijuana includes a gummy with more than 0.3% THC. That's the end result of it, because if it doesn't meet the, um, well, products that meet the definition of hemp in law are excluded from the definition of marijuana in law, but when it doesn't meet that definition of hemp in law, then it becomes marijuana by law. So this is something that any of you involved in uh, selling hemp products will need to be aware of. Um, so another change that was in the new law was the requirement, uh, if you're going to sell edible hemp products in Virginia, you have to have you have to submit an edible hemp price disclosure form. An edible hemp price disclosure form basically is a form that lists out the laws and you are essentially acknowledging that you have seen the law and that you understand the law and that you intend to comply with the law. And then you submit that to VDAX. And once you have that form in place, then uh, you can sell legal edible hemp products in Virginia. And we're gonna talk some more as we go through the slides what um, what requirements there are to have a legal edible hemp product. And I also want to mention that an edible hemp product includes any product that is consumed orally. If it goes in the mouth and down to the stomach, even if it's uh, a tincture or uh, any anything, uh, dietary supplements, anything that goes in the mouth and down to the stomach in Virginia is going to be considered an edible hemp product. I know when we first started with these edible hemp products disclosure forms, there was a lot of confusion over tinctures and oils. Uh, lots of people don't consider that to be an edible product. And while you know, I see where they could get that idea, but I just wanna emphasize that anything that goes in the mouth down to the stomach is going to be considered an edible hemp product. And to sell those in Virginia, you do have to submit the edible hemp products disclosure form. In addition to the edible hemp products disclosure form, you also have to have either a food safety permit, or if you meet certain criteria in law to be exempt from routine food safety inspections, you have to certify to the Department of Agriculture on a form that you do meet those criteria and you have to have that form on file. So if you don't meet the criteria to be exempt, if you're handling foods that are not fully packaged, which is probably the main one on the list of things you can that you have to meet to be to meet those criteria to be exempt from routine food safety inspection. If you meet those criteria, then you have to have that form on file. If you don't meet the criteria, then you either have to have a permit from VDAX Food Safety, or if you uh, are subject to Virginia Department of Health inspection, a permit from Virginia Department of Health also satisfies that requirement to either be under food safety inspection or certify that you meet the uh, criteria to be exempt from food safety inspection. And I just want to emphasize that a food permit is required to manufacture food products containing hemp extract. There is no exemption in law for uh, manufacturing food products containing hemp extract. And if you're wholesaling food products that contain hemp extract, or even if you're wholesaling food products that don't contain food uh, hemp extract, I'll also mention that here too, 
you do have to have a food permit. There is no exemption from inspection from anybody who wholesales food products in Virginia. If you are selling products to other businesses who will resell them, that's what we call wholesale sales, and there is no exemption for that. So if you're doing that, you do need to be under um, food safety inspection for those processes. And this big red line uh, highlighted in red, that's something I really want to emphasize because uh, the laws in July of 2023 gave VDAX the ability to issue civil penalties up to $10,000 a day per violation of the Virginia Food and Drink Law. And this is something we are actively is issuing to people that we find in violation of the law. And this is really important for you to understand that this, this is a significant thing that you want to try to avoid. And I, I honestly spent a lot of time on the phone trying to help people understand what these laws mean. And I would much rather spend, you know, some time, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or however long it takes, I would much rather spend that time trying to help someone avoid having these civil penalties show up in their inbox or in their mail uh, versus trying to help somebody get out of hot water once they've had these civil penalties issued to them. So if you're involved in the selling of hemp extracts and you don't know, you don't fully understand what's, what the requirements are and you would really like to avoid getting civil penalties from VDAX, uh, please do reach out to us because we want to help you avoid this in the first place. But if you do get if you do get issued civil penalties um, and you still don't understand why, what happened, please do contact us then as well, because we would like to help you understand why that happened and how to avoid it in the future and how you as a retailer or wholesaler or manufacturer can have the best outcome in that situation and how to avoid it going forward in the future. Okay, and so the next slides that I have here are about uh, how to, you know, how to meet the laws and how to avoid civil penalties. And I'm gonna have the word civil penalties on a lot of these slides because that's something that I think will be a pretty strong incentive for people to, you know, to make an effort to really understand the laws because no, nobody wants to get a letter from VDAC saying you owe civil penalties. So the first one on the list here is that the product that you're selling must be from an approved source. And approved source means the following. It means that the, the product manufacturer is inspected by the regulatory agency responsible for food safety inspections in the state where the product is made. And it also um, means that the product that is being made is uh, that contains hemp ex extract is compliant with that state's requirements for food products containing hemp extract. So in addition to that, what it means is if the state itself where it's being, where the products are being produ produced if the state does not recognize CBD or hemp extract as a lawful food ingredient, like Virginia does, then that product cannot be compliant with that state's laws. And uh, there are a few states where products are being made, and a lot of products are being made, and yet the state does not have anything in their law saying it's a legal food ingredient, even though that state does not uh, take a lot of action to do anything about it. And they, you know, in a lot of cases they don't because it's political and they just cannot get into it because it's everywhere. If they're not taking action against it, that does not mean that it's entirely legal in that state. So um, you do have to be mindful of the fact that the state has to have some laws and regulations for hemp extract to be in food before we would accept it to be, a, a, you know, considered an approved source. And then also, a third party GMP audit would not be a substitute for that state's regulatory inspection of the manufacturer making those products in that state. So uh, looking at the products themselves, the products that you're wanting to sell must be accompanied by a certificate of analysis from an, from an ISO 17025 accredited lab. Uh, the certificate of analysis is a test analysis report that describes uh, the cannabinoid content of the product. It would have how much CBD is in the product, how much THC is in the product, as well as a number of other cannabinoids that would be in the products. The law itself says that the product has to be accompanied by a certificate of analysis. 
And the question when we first started, you know, regulating on these laws was, what do we mean by a company by a certificate of analysis? Well, if you get very literal, it kind of means that the product would have a piece of that right from the very start did not seem like a very um, reasonable expectation for these products, nor a reasonable expectation for us as regulators. And it was a common practice then and now to uh, connect that certificate of analysis to the product via a QR code. And so we do accept a QR code as a way to tie that product to the certificate of analysis, as long as the QR code does actually lead to a certificate of analysis. And we've encountered many products where the QR code leads to a website and there's no way for us as regulators to find a COA on that website. So if you are going to retail these products, you will want to ensure that the QR code does actually lead to a certificate of analysis. Otherwise, we're not going to accept that as being accompanied by a certificate of analysis. Uh, I've already mentioned this next one here, but uh, it, you know, we'll mention it again in the list of things that the product has to meet. The product must not contain a total THC con con concentration greater than 0.3%. Total THC includes all THC isomers plus the adjusted weight of THCA all added together. And then the product must not contain these synthetic cannabinoids like HHC, THCP, THCO, and many other uh, synthetic cannabinoids that have been developed over the last few years. This thing about synthetic cannabinoids is not specifically listed in uh, the, the Virginia Food and Drink Law, but the Virginia Food and Drink Law does reference parts of law in the Virginia Consumer Protection Act, and that's where you can find this prohibition on the synthetic cannabinoids that could be in the products. And so um, it, it's kind of messy how they did the laws. I don't know, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be critical of it because I, I, I don't know that I could have done any better or that anybody else could have done any better, but it is very messy how the laws are done because part of the law is in the hemp laws, part of the law is in, in the Virginia Food and Drink Law, and part of the laws are in the Virginia Consumer Protection Act. So it does make it very difficult, um, not only for us as regulators, but it makes it really difficult for people who are trying to follow law. And that is why uh, I don't hesitate to spend more time with someone trying to help them understand what the law means, because I can only imagine what it would be like for me, someone on the outside trying to follow these laws that are kind of in multiple different locations and really hard to pinpoint what they actually mean. But um, so, I, you know, we try, we've tried to put these things in one place for you in these slides here, uh, but obviously there's going to be a whole lot more to it than what I can present today. But this does give a good overview. Okay, another major change in the laws from 2023 was that the product itself must contain no more than two milligrams of total THC per package. However, if there is more than two milligrams of THC, total THC in the package, it can have more than that as long as there is an amount of CBD in the product that uh, amounts to a, rate, a, T, a CBD to THC ratio of 25 to one. In other words, if you have um, however many milligrams of THC you have in that product, whether it's you know, three, four, 20, however many milligrams of THC you have in there, you have to have 25 milligrams of CBD for every one milligram of THC. So that's the 25 to one ratio that you may have already heard of. Uh, and that's what that's talking about. If the product contains any THC at all, uh, the packaging must be child resistant and resealable if there's more than one serving in the product. It doesn't have to be child resistant once it's been opened and then resealed. This is how we have been uh, interpreting it. Uh, the lawmakers may have had a different idea on that, but it doesn't say specifically. And so therefore we're not trying to apply more than what the law specifically says. And when it comes to child resistance, that's uh, not outlined very well in the law either, but uh, what we go by is if the packaging can be um, difficult for a child of five and younger to open, then we'll consider that child resistant. That makes it a little subjective versus very object, you know, versus what we like to, for it to be, you know, 
we like for it to be objective, but it's not objective, it's more subjective, and that makes it difficult for all of us. But um, if you're going to make these products, you just want to take steps to make sure that a child five and under can't open it. There are companies out there that do make products that are certified child resistant. It's not a government operated organization that does that, but that organization does try to take the steps to ensure that the products meet requirements that could be considered child resistant by just about anybody that looks at it. But we are not at this time requiring that the, that the packaging uh, have that certified child resistant uh, label on it, but that is one way that you can ensure that your packaging is child resistant if you do purchase it from that, purchase it with that certification on it. Okay, and this next one, this has been a difficult one for everybody to understand. No person shall offer for sale or sell a regulated hemp product that depicts or is in the shape of a human, animal, vehicle, or fruit. When we first started with these regulations, we were really concerned about the gummy bears and the gummy worms and the crawlers that were out there, the ones that really looked like kids' candies. And even as regulators, we were not very focused on a lot of the imaging that's on the labels. But after a couple of months of working with these, reg uh, these new laws, we realized that the word depicts does tell us that the product should not also have pictures of these items on there. So uh, it should not have images on the labels of humans, animals, vehicles, or fruits, nor should they be in the shapes of any of these uh, items listed here. And I guess that's sufficient on that one. Okay, and this next one, this last one on this slide is a requirement that comes from our regulations. Hemp derived ingredients must meet the def definition of extract given in 2VAC 5-595-10. That's our current regulation that supports the previous law. I will tell you here that this regulation 595-10 does need to be updated because there are some parts of this regulation don't, that don't fully uh, match the new laws and updating this regulations will be something that we'll do um, as we have time, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later. But there are parts of the regulations that are still applicable, including this definition of extract in law. So this definition that we have in this regulation, uh, the Administrative Code of Virginia, excludes THCs other than Delta-9 THC. However, we do make an exception for CBN and THCV. And there's some stories behind that, but if you ever want to know why that is, you can ask me. But for right now, I'll just say that uh, in an edible food product, edible hemp product, uh, if you have a THC other than Delta 9 THC, it's going to be a, a problem for you because it's not going to meet our uh, definition of extract in law. And if at any point you need further explanation on that, please do contact me. I'll be happy to cover that with you. Okay, so statement of identity on your labeling, you must have the statement of identity on the principal display panel, which is the very front panel of the product. The statement of identity must adequately describe the product. And I'll stop here to say, when it comes to labeling an edible hemp product, the labeling must not only match the Regula, uh, the labeling regulations in 21 CFR 101, which is the federal regulations for food labeling, it also needs to meet the regulations or the laws that are specific to hemp products. So it's got to first meet that uh, normal food regulation labeling, and then it also has to meet the requirements for hemp, uh, hemp extract products. So the statement of identity, that requirement is the same as for regular food as well as for edible hemp products. Statement of net quantity of contents that must be on the principal display panel in both U.S. customary and metric measures, just like for any other food product. The label must state the amount of food in a single serving, and the amount has to be in a weight or volume. A number or count without the measure is not sufficient. So if your product uh, single serving size is one gummy. You can't just say one gummy. You have to say how many milligrams or how many grams is that gummy. Or if it's a, uh, a tincture or an oil, you can't just say 
one dropper full, you also have to include the measurement in milliliters. So it would be like one milliliter or a half a milliliter or whatever your single serving size is. Uh, so uh, again, one one gummy or one dropper full are not going to meet this requirement in law in the laws that you have to have the amount of food in a single serving. With the statement of ingredients, you have to list, and this again is just like for any other food ingredient, you have to list all the ingredients in the food, including all sub-ingredients of any ingredient made of two or more substances. They all have to be listed on the label. And if the product contains any allergens, they must be declared on the label. Uh, there are nine major allergens. If you need those major allergens listed out for you, you can ask that in the uh, questions. I didn't list them out here, but if you need to know those, Megan can hook you up with that list. The product packaging must also have the name and address of the manufacturer or distributor. Uh, you cannot have just a website on the label. You have to have the actual name and address of the manufacturer distributor. That would be the, um, at least, at the very minimum, it would be the city and the state and the zip code. If you have your business, if, if the physical business is listed in a public directory, you can shorten that address down to the city, state, and zip. If you do not have your business listed with all the information on the address listed in the public directory, then you would also have to have the street number and the street name in addition to the city, state, and zip code. Next, if the product is labeled as containing specific cannabinoids, the number of milligrams of each cannabinoid must be declared on the label. For example, if your product says that it contains CBD and Delta-9 THC and CBG, this is just a random example. You would have to have the number of milligrams of each of those cannabinoids on the label. If you, you know, we know that full spectrum hemp extract has a, a lot of different cannabinoids in it. If you choose to list a lot of those minor cannabinoids on the, on the label of your full spectrum hemp extract, if you choose to do that, then you would have to, in order to meet the regulations, you would have to have the number of milligrams of each of those uh, minor cannabinoids also listed on your label. So really, it's you're better off to not list all those on your label unless you want to go to the trouble of trying to list the milligrams of each on the label. We've had that situation with a lot of people. They want to let their customers know that it's you know it's got CBC and CBG and a lot of different minor cannabinoids, but uh, they run into that issue of having to list the milligrams of each. And so the better solution, unless you want to go to that trouble, is to you know let your customer get that information from the certificate of analysis versus trying to put it on your label. But that's up to you. You can do whichever you choose. The next one is really important. Uh, the product must have a legible batch code number on the product label. And it needs to be, um, it, the batch number that's on there, I may say this elsewhere, but you must also have a batch number, a matching batch number on the certificate of analysis so that um, a customer, your customer and the regulators will be able to uh, have awareness that that certificate of analysis actually goes with that product. This is something we've run into a lot where the product itself may have a batch code on there and batch codes are important for traceability. If you ever had an issue with that product and had to do a recall, you certainly would not want to be in a situation where you have to recall every product you ever made that's, you know, that same type of product. You would want to narrow it down to only the batches that are affected. And this same concept, it's the same concept with any manufactured food. You'd want to have a batch code on there. And then for these products where you have a certificate of analysis, the batch code should be on that certificate of analysis so you can tie that COA to that product to ensure that the results that are on that COA are what's in that product that you're holding in your hand at the time. The next item is the label must not contain a claim indicating that the product is intended for diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevent, prevention of disease. Anytime you make a claim on a product of any kind, not just these products, but of any kind, that it's going to diagnose or cure your diseases, then that then automatically becomes a drug. That's an FDA thing where if you put those kind of requirements on or labeling on there, then automatically the product is, is considered a drug by the FDA. 
So this has been a difficult thing for people wanting to make products containing CBD and other hemp extracts because it is widely known that some of these products may in fact have a beneficial effect on a person's health. And, you know, they want to let their customers know that. Well, I sentiment when you start putting those claims on your product, that turns it into a drug. And so you do need to avoid that. The good part is most of your customers that are looking for these products already know why they're looking for it. And you don't really have to tell them that because they already know most of this stuff. So um, over year, over the years, that's really, uh, you know, people know what they're looking for and they know why they're looking for it. You don't really need to put it on your label and it will just get you some civil penalties if you do that. So avoid that. And this next one, the packaging and labeling of a regulated hemp product must not bear any significant likeness to another manufacturer's product. So this is one of the main things that was the driver for these new laws is the imitation lookalike Skittles candies and uh, Doritos products that look like Dor Doritos with Delta 8 sprayed all over them. And the, the gummy bear products that look like gummy bear candies. There were a lot of lookalike. There were cereal bars that looked like uh, the Lucky Charms cereal packaging, but they were, uh, and I think they just took Lucky Charms cereal and made cereal bars from them and put a bunch of high amounts of intoxicating cannabinoids in it and put it in packaging with the, the magic elf or whatever, look like Lucky Charms cereal packaging. So that's what this part is talking about. You cannot imitate any other manufacturer out there. I was like uh, very surprised that I didn't see evidence of a lot of lawsuits from the major brands manufacturers. Maybe there were some I just didn't become aware of, but you definitely don't want your product to look like any major brand because um, the manufacturer of those the legal manufacturer of those national brands could sue you, but even worse, VDAX will send you civil penalties for doing that. So you don't want to do that. Okay, this next one, if the product contains THC, there must be an age restriction statement. The preferred statement that we have in law is may not be sold to persons younger than 21. We do accept versions of that, but the, the statement that you use has to have the same meaning that it may not be sold to persons younger than 21. Um, this applies to even full spectrum hemp extract oils when there's THC in it. So that's something that people along the way have not really understood. And I wanted to kind of emphasize that if you have any THC in your product, I mean, there could be some cases where there's only a trace amount but if you're aware of the fact that there's THC in your product, any, in any particular amount, then you do need to have that age statement on your uh, product. And if the product does contain THC, then the label must state the number of milligrams of THC in each serving. If the product contains THC, the label must state the total milligrams of THC included in the package. And if the product contains THC, the label must state the total percentage of THC in the product. And the general statement of less than 0.3% THC does not meet this requirement. That's been a difficult one for people to meet because they're unsure how, you know, what to put on their product when their product can vary a little bit. So if you have quite, if you're in that situation and you have questions about that, you can reach out to myself or to Mega Music and we can help you know what you can use. Uh, you can also have that less than 0.3% THC, but that can't be the only statement. You also have to have the amount of THC in there. For example, if you know that your product routinely contains about 0 0.28%, 0 point, yeah, 0.28% or 0.26 or 0.18 or whatever you, you know, routinely have in your product, you have to have that percentage on there and then uh, you can or don't have to include this less than 0.3%. A lot of people want to still put this less than 0.3% on the product too, because that's what people are used to seeing to know that it complies with the farm bill stuff. But in Virginia, for you know products sold in Virginia, you also have to have the percentage of the actual percentage of THC in that product. And then the last thing, I'm just going to touch just one little bit on the topical products containing hemp extract, because a lot of people 
have just stuck with topical products containing hemp extract instead of trying to make human consumable. There's not a lot of things that we're going to do with the topical product. Topical products still have to have less than 0.3% THC, but we're not going to get into a situation where we're routinely testing products to ensure that it has less than 0.3% THC. However, I will tell you that if ever there is a situation where it looks like somebody is selling products advertised as topical, but it looks like a lot of people might be purchasing it and consuming it, then I, I promise you somebody's going to look into that. But the only requirement right now that we're expecting to see on topicals is that it includes a label stating that the product is not intended for human consumption. And that's really the only requirement that, we're, that we really have with topicals. Uh, it just has to have that statement. And there is a thing in law that if the product was made prior to uh, July the 1st of 2023 and it does not have this label on it, and there's something on the product to indicate it was made before that date and records to show that it was made before that date, then it doesn't have to have that labeling. But I've been advising people that wherever possible, uh, you know, and it is possible, I would go ahead and apply a label if it doesn't have that label that the product is not intended for human consumption. That is something that you can do uh, post-manufacturing. Uh, just add a label to the product that's not intended for human consumption, and that should have you covered for that. So if you have any questions about, further questions about that, you can feel free to ask. And then I want to talk just a few minutes about our activities within the Office of Hemp Enforcement. This is a brand new program. The laws enacted in 2023 gave us the ability to develop this program to, um, to regulate based on these new laws. And uh, I guess it's a good thing for me to mention what regulated hemp products are. Regulated hemp products include the edible hemp products that, like I said, they're orally ingestible products such as gummies, cookies, candies, tinctures, and dietary supplements. We're currently actively conducting edible hemp product inspections of many businesses throughout the Commonwealth. We're actively inspecting, uh, all just we're actively in conducting inspections of retailers as well as wholesalers. And we haven't been into uh, very many manufacturers, but we will be going into manufacturers as well. We will be soon uh, doing inspections of inhalable products such as vapes and smokable flour. We won't be doing those products until we develop our registration system because in law there is a requirement that everybody who's selling these products, these regulated hemp products be registered with a $1,000 annual fee for selling these products, but that part of the law has not been enforced because we don't yet have the registration systems in place for doing that. Once we finish hiring everybody for the Office of Hemp Enforcement and develop that registration system, we will also be um, enforcing that part of the law that you have to be registered if you're selling any of these regulated hemp products. So that would not apply to anybody selling the topicals, just the ones that are selling the regulated hemp products, which include the edibles, the inhalable products, uh, which includes both the smokable and the vaping products. And when I say later date, I don't really have a date. I don't see that we would have anything ready until about the end of May or June at this point. If you are actively selling vaping products or edible hemp products, or not edibles, if you're actively selling smokable flour or vaping products, and you want to touch base, with us, touch base with us from time to time to see what our estimated timeline is, I'm happy to give you a date, but I make no guarantees that that date is accurate because I, you know, I just don't know how it's going to go as we work towards getting ready to develop that registration system. I will also throw in there when it comes to especially smokable flour, even though we are not actively regulating those products at this time, if any of those products do not meet the definition in law of industrial hemp products, then law enforcement could take action on those products because if they don't meet the requirements for industrial, industrial hemp, if they exceed the 0.3% total THC or they have more than two milligrams per package and don't also contain an amount of CBD that meets that 25 to one ratio, then law enforcement could take action on those products as marijuana. And if you have further questions about that, 
and you want to contact me at a later date to, you know, to ask more about that, you certainly can. But I do want to give you that caution that law enforcement could take action on that, even, you know, even while VDAX is not right now doing that. So as Office of Hemp Enforcement, our primary purpose is to enforce the law. And we uh, work, we work to assist in determining sellers of edible hemp products have taken the required steps to lawfully sell those products. We are actively evaluating edible hemp products that we see offered for sale. And we're comparing what those products look like and where they're coming from to the requirements in law. And we do issue, issue civil penalties for violations of the law. And we work very hard to try to educate what the laws mean. And as the inspectors go out to retailers to do the inspections, they can provide some answers to questions and provide resources. And they also provide contact information to uh, myself or others in the compliance team that can more completely answer all the questions to help manufacturers, wholesalers, and sellers of these products avoid civil penalties and sell only legal products in Virginia. And I know I've been through this information pretty quickly, um, providing here the contact information for Office of Hemp Enforcement, my direct contact information, this cell phone number for me is my only number. I do spend a lot of time on the phone because I express to you I want to help everyone who wants to know what the law means. I want to help you understand what the law is. I do spend a lot of time on the phone, but if you call me and don't get me, please leave a message and I'll return your call. I do also accept text messages. I don't want you to feel like you don't have a resource to get your answers, so we will get your answers to you as best we can. And then we do also have some information on our VDAX website. A portion of our website is dedicated to hemp enforcement. And also here is information for the hemp, the VDAX hemp program. They deal with the registration, registration requirements for growers, handlers of hemp plant material and processors of hemp plant material. So if you are a processor of hemp plant material and you're going to make products that contain hemp extract intended for human consumption, you actually have to register with the VDAX hemp program to have the legal authority to be in possession of the hemp plant material. And then you also have to submit an application with VDAX to be able to process those products into uh, products that are intended for human consumption. If you're going to process the hemp plant material into topicals only, or if you're going to be making fiber or any other uh, non-human consumable products, then all you need to do is get that processor registration from VDAX hemp program and you don't need involvement with the Office of Hemp Enforcement. So I hope that I've answered a lot of your questions today. A little more uh, resources here that can be shared with you um, with copies of these slides. And that's really all I have. So I will stop sharing and see what kind of questions haven't already been answered, what I can help with. Lisa, thank you so much. Um, we get a lot of questions uh, repeatedly. There are several questions that we get on an ongoing basis regarding um, hemp plants, hemp flowers, hemp seeds being able to be sold at markets. And the answer has always been no, that is not legal to be sold at a farmer's market. Is um, Can you tell me what is the case now with the new law that went into effect in July regarding the selling so of it, everybody wanted, wants to know what's up with that. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're, you know, if hemp seeds, okay, this is a good place to talk about hemp seeds. If we're talking about hemp seeds that are intended for, you know, food, hemp seeds are actually hemp seeds and oil made from hemp seeds and uh, protein powders made entirely from hemp seeds. Those are all actually FDA approved ingredients. And you can find hemp hearts in the grocery store. You can purchase hemp powder. A lot of people will put hemp powder into their smoothies as a protein boost. Those are all FDA approved ingredients for food because the hemp seeds themselves, of course, they do have to be manufactured in a way that prevents cross-contamination from THC in the hemp plant material. 
but when they are processed properly to avoid contamination with THC, those are all FDA approved products. And you don't have to have anything from BDAX Hemp Enforcement to make anything with hemp seeds, hemp oil, or hemp uh, powder that does not have THC in it, and that are made from approved source hemp seeds. Uh, but if you're talking about hemp seeds that are viable seeds that you would put in a pot of soil or in your garden to grow the hemp plant material, that is a no-no along with hemp plants because if you're selling, selling them to a person, the only people you could sell those to are people who are registered with the VDAX hemp program as people who are allowed to grow or handle the hemp plant material. And when this whole thing started, this hemp program, the USDA hemp program and the VDAX hemp program, they maintain a database of everyone who is registered to be in possession of the hemp plant material. And this is shared with law enforcement to avoid somebody who's legally allowed to grow hemp plant material to not get swooped in by law enforcement who's coming over to their field saying, you're selling marijuana, you're going to jail now. Mm -hmm. And that's how they avoid that situation. So you can sell your hemp plants to people who are registered with the VDAX hemp program, but um, you'll need to work that out with a VDAX hemp program, who you can sell to, who you, you know, if they're not registered with a VDAX hemp program, then you can't sell them to those people. And if you are registered with a VDAX hemp program and you have plants that you want to sell, um, you're not going to be able to take them to the farm mar farmer's market for general sale to the public because those people walking into the farmer's market, they are not going to be registered in general with the, the VDAX hemp program. So that's the short version of why you can't do that. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about, you were talking a lot about uh, hemp and the hemp extract and edible products, things of that sort in general, and making those, the requirements for making those products in general, but what, and I know that anything that has um, hemp in it still has to go through VDAX food safety recipe approval also, but can you tell me a little bit about what can be sold specifically at farmers markets um, regarding the edible type products that you were talking, all of the edible type products that you were talking about? Because I'm thinking none of what you're talking about can be sold at farmers markets, really. Right. So the requirements are that every retailer, and let me clarify what is meant by retailer. There are many kinds of retailers, but in every case of what a retailer is, a retailer is going to be somebody who sells products directly to the end consumer. The person who is going to, you know, the person and or their family, uh, you know, they may purchase the product and then take it home and serve it to all the people at the family reunion, but they're not reselling those products. So they're considered the end consumer. If you're selling it to the end consumer, that's retail sales. There are many different ways to do retail sales. You can retail, um, within a storefront. You can retail online. You can retail at a farmer's market. You can retail on the side of the road somewhere. All those sales that are directly to the end consumer are retail sales. And anyone who is conducting resale, retail sales, these laws are going to be applicable to those folks. I can imagine there have been some situations where people have been selling products at the farmer's market that are hemp products, and they didn't realize that they were required to do this. And this is a place that we have not been putting our focus on yet, but at some point we will be, you know, addressing what's happening at farmers markets uh, because a vendor at a farmers market that is selling these products. They are a retailer, and the law does require that every retail operation that is selling these products has to submit an edible hemp price disclosure form and has to certify either either be under food safety inspection or certify to the department that you are exempt from routine food safety inspection for every location where you sell those products. And when we do have that registration system in place, you'll have to have a, a $1,000 annual fee registration for every location where the sales occurs. So that's gonna be a big problem for somebody who wants to smell, wants to sell um, you know, a small amount of products at this farmer's market and at that farmer's market and that farmer's market. That unfortunately is gonna be very pro problematic for that person. Because if they wanted to continue doing that legally and meet all the requirements in law, 
they would have to register each location that, that they're going to be selling those products. So the other thing I'll mention here is the laws require that products be packaged and labeled on sale. And so this is another thing that we haven't spent a lot of time addressing, but this is a good place to address that. It doesn't allow for the addition of CBD to products to be sold as an open, ready to consume product. So I know this is this was happening before, and we haven't spent much time on this, you know, since the new, new laws came about because we've been focusing all of our, mo the majority of our time going into the hundreds of tobacco shops across the state that are selling all these crazy products, you know, lots of, you know, really bad products. So these other situations, we just have not been putting a lot of time into that. But for people who are, you know, opening up packages of products that contain CBD and putting it into a smoothie, technically that's no longer allowed because you're selling a product at retail that is not packaged and labeled with the amount of CBD in that product and the certificate of analysis for that product. So technically that's not allowed. And well, le legally and lawfully, that's not allowed. So, um, you know, I guess I'm telling you today, if you're doing that now, you should probably stop because when we do get around to, to look at that, it's not going to be allowed. Now that doesn't stop you as a retailer from selling a smoothie and then also at the same time selling somebody a packaged product that they can then open up and put in their own product. You know, that's something, I don't know how doable that is. That's may not be something that as the retailer, they may not, may not feel like that's what they want to do. They may not like that idea, but that is a possibility. But as far as, you know, taking the open package of product in, in the back room and, you know, preparing the smoothies and then putting the CBD in the product and taking that to the consumer and, and giving it to them that way, that's not, that's not going to be in compliance with the law unfortunately. Okay. You had mentioned um, getting the products uh, a certificate of analysis. Can you give us, is there a list or um, do you have available the manufacturers of hemp products that, that uh, here's my question, where can these potential manufacturers of hemp products go for product testing so they can get a certificate of analysis? There are a lot of labs that are ISO 17025 accredited and ISO 17025 accreditation. Let me let me just touch on what that means just for very briefly. ISO 17025 is a set of standards that laboratories can meet that shows they have a robust quality management system. And once that system is in place and they have all the documentation, they're using uh, specific testing um, methods that have been uh, validated. They have all the, all the pieces and parts in place. That means that the testing they generate can be relied on for correctness and accurateness. So that's what the ISO 17025 is. And if you call a lab and ask them, are they, are they ISO 17025 accredited? They will know if they are accredited or not. If they say, I don't know, hang up the phone and find another lab because no lab that is ISO 17025 accredited doesn't know that they are because it is a huge deal to be ISO 17025 accredited. So there are a number of testing laboratories that are accredited and we see a lot of them all the time. The major labs in Virginia that do testing are ISO 17025. There is a list of laboratories on the VDAX website of a few labs that are used by the hemp growers. This is something that the um, VDAX hemp program set up for all their growers that needed to have resources of where labs can be. We did run into a situation where some of those labs for the hemp plant material weren't ISO 17025 accredited. And so I asked the hemp program to update that list to reflect if they're not ISO 17025 accredited. So uh, there is that list there, but it should not be very hard to find a lab that is ISO 17025 accredited. If you're somebody that has never had your products tested, I do recommend that you kind of call around with a, you know, a number of labs because the, the cost of testing can be very high. And I would do a price comparison too. So that's just kind of a random suggestion. If I were a uh, manufacturer, I would want to do a price comparison uh, of multiple different laboratories. And you can probably find a list just by Googling ISO 17025 accredited testing laboratories for hemp products. So I don't have a set list. We do have 
Uh, some known labs that we see all the time, but I'm not going to share that list right here today. If somebody wants more information on, on that, I can share that with them if they contact me. Uh, but there are lots of labs available for that. They're, they're in a lot of different places, including in Virginia. Okay, thank you. I think we have the list. I think that was provided last year. So it's under our resources. So we can we can share that also, the ones that are specifically approved through VDEX. Um, we have a question. When can a retailer be exempt from inspection? The product doesn't contain cannabinoids. Is there a threshold of products sold? So if the products contain hemp extract, uh, so this, this exemption that I was talking about, that's exemption from food safety inspection. And I'll, I'll explain on that a little bit. Being exempt from food safety inspection is different from being exempt from uh, inspection by the Office of Hemp Enforcement. If you're selling products that contain hemp extract, then you're not going to be exempt from inspection by the Office of Hemp Enforcement. If you are selling products that are prepackaged and come from an approved source, and you're not selling any open products, they're all prepackaged, then you can be exempt from food safety inspection by the VDEX um, food, food safety program or by VDH. We do have exemptions in the law that apply to retailers that are selling only prepackaged foods, and this exemption applies to those folks too. But we do have an exemption form that they have to fill out, and that way we have it on record that they're exempt and there's no question because they've they've looked at the criteria to be exempt and they've um, submitted that form to us. We have it on documentation that they're that they are exempt. If we don't have that document on you know on file, then they haven't met that um, expectation that they either be under food safety inspection with a permit or have certified to the department they meet the exemptions from food safety inspection. But if they're selling products that contain hemp extract then they're not going to be exempt from Office of Hemp Enforcement Inspection. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one last question, and this may be, um, I'm not sure if Rochelle or Karen or somebody is with us, um, but the question is, it is my understanding that Virginia farmers markets are an extension of the farm um, and not considered a physical retail location. This is a question from somebody in the chat. So if it's a retail, if they're retailing it, just like I was explaining before, there's many different ways to retail. If they are retailing right on the farm, that does not make them exempt from having to comply with the law on these edible, or on these regulated hemp products. They're not going to be exempt from having to comply with the law on that, regardless of where they're selling it from. Right. Because they're selling, as long as you're selling it to a consumer. consumer yes. Facing, right? It's considered. That's what I was, that was my knowledge. Um, okay. Uh, any last questions regarding hemp or CBD? To sum up, no selling hemp plants, hemp seeds that can go into dirt, hemp flowers at a farmer's market, hemp seeds that are edible to go into granola and things of that sort, um, into products, they fall under VDAX food safety. Um, no selling cannabis or products that have THC at farmer's markets? <laughs> and what about products that are um, products like uh, bath and beauty, bath bombs, lotions, things of that sort that say that they have um, hemp in them? So those are topicals. Right. And topicals also have to have meet those um, requirements in law regarding the THC, as I was saying before, because there's not... The law itself does not exempt those products from meeting those requirements. But uh, what I was kind of alluding to, if you're making, for example, a lotion or a cream or a salve, this is not me giving you permission to have more than the required amount of THC in the product, but I am telling you that we're not going to be testing those products. The only time, you know, and I, I feel very comfortable with being very transparent on this, so if you have a salve that has more than two milligrams of THC in your salve and not enough CBD to make that one to 25, it's highly unlikely you're ever gonna get in trouble for that because nobody's gonna be testing it. However, the example I have used with several other people have asked the same question. If you are selling big bottles of massage oil that look just like the tincture oil, they have the same grade as tincture oils. If you're selling these big bottles of 
massage oil and all of a sudden it's, it's come to our awareness that this massage oil is pretty popular even if it's labeled not for human consumption we're probably going to we're probably going to test that and if it exceeds those levels then you're going to be in trouble because you're not meeting the requirements in law but unless you're selling a product that looks like people are using it as food instead of what its intended purpose is for uh, topicals, then you're not going to run into any trouble with that. I don't foresee anybody taking a salve and testing it to see if it meets those uh, requirements for THC. So that's not me saying it's okay to do that, but it's uh, envision anybody looking at that. Okay. And I know we have um, Carolyn with uh, pet food coming up, but, and so this is a crossover question, but we have seen at farmer's markets vendors selling pet food with um, CBD hemp in it. Is that legal? Hi, this is Caroline Wilkinson. Um, no, you are not allowed to have CBD, THC, or hemp in any um, pet food that has a guaranteed analysis. Okay, thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Are there any last questions? If you have any last questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much. This is probably one of the things that we get the most questions. Uh, this and can we have chicks at a farmer's market are probably the things we get the most questions <laughs> asked. Um, and so I really appreciate you being here today and staying on top of it all because it is a very complex um, topic. And so uh, I greatly appreciate it. Lisa's presentation will be um, forwarded out also with all of the resource materials. Any additional questions that you have, we will forward those over to her or drop them um, uh, drop them in the chat box. And next we have um, Caroline Wilkinson and she is the Agricultural Commodities Program Team Leader at VDAX. And she's gonna talk to us about pet food requirements and um, selling at farmer's markets. So thank you, Carolyn. I will let you take it away. And you haven't even started and you've got questions in the Q&A. So um, yes, hopefully um, hopefully that's helping. I'm trying to answer them as they go along. Uh, so is this? Okay, can y'all see this? Yes. Perfect. Well, I am Caroline Wilkinson. I'm with the Virginia Department of Ag Agriculture and Consumer Services, and I'm in the Agricultural Commodities Program. And our program um, inspect and regulate animal food, which includes pet food, pet treats, um, seed, fertilizer, lime, as well as animal remedies. Um, but I'm here just to talk about pet treats because we get a lot of questions about that and the requirements to sell here in Virginia. So to sell pet treats in Virginia, you will have to get a commercial feed license and this licensing year is from January 1st to December 31st. The cost of the license is $50 and it is an annual, annual license, an annual fee. So we send out renewals for this license um, probably mid-November and send to your contact information that we have in the system. And um, when you get that renewal, you can decide if you want to um, renew, if you need to change your information, or if you want to cancel, um, that's a good time to, to look at those things. In addition to the license, um, for anyone selling pet treats, we could require product registrations. Our registration, our product registration year is the same as the licensing of the January 1st to December 31st, and each prepackaged product registered is $50. And once again, this is the annual fee, so it's every year. <clears throat> Um, we also have um, fee tonnage. This form is due in February 1st of every year. Um, this is for anyone who is selling feed and treats uh, loosely um, or in packages greater than 10 pounds. Um, if you are selling prepackaged pet treats, you are exempt. All you have to do is click that little thing that just highlighted in yellow. You mark that. And then you do need to sign, date, and return the form to our office just so we have that on file. So pet treats can be manufactured um, in your home kitchen. An inspection prior to the manufacturing is not required, but we are um, allowed by the statute 3.24809 to come in and conduct an inspection at any time. Uh, also, please remember when you are manufacturing to be sure to follow um, FDA's good 
current good manufacturing practices for animal food. Um, you can search that online and I can also drop this information into the chat, but it just talks about making sure you're following good um, current good manufacturing practicing practices when you are making the pet treat. <clears throat> so labeling. We actually review all small packaged feed labels prior um, to you being licensed and registered. So it is a requirement to send in your label when you send in your commercial feed application and your payment. Um, as you can see, I put the statute up here, but we um, review all these the labels to make sure it has what is required. There are several requirements that must be on the label. I'm gonna go through in just a minute. Um, and, and we look at that, um, for example, ingredients, we actually have must be improved ingredients to be in a pet food. So we look at those um, pretty closely, making sure that whatever's in that is safe for animal consumption. So label requirements. Um, first thing is your brand name. So you can have Bucky's Biscuit Bits. You can have Sweet Potato Biscuits. You can have... Um, kitty crunchy snacks or something of that nature. It's just whatever brand name that you want to have for your product. And then the kind of pet has to be um, either written on the front part of the label if it's not a part of the brand name. So like crazy kitty crunchies, you wouldn't have to put for cat consumption because it's um, staying in the name that is for cats. Um, you can, but it's not necessarily a requirement if it's in that name. If you just have peppermint treats and they're specifically for horses, you're going to need to put that on your label that they're for horses. Um, a quantity statement is required as well on our label. Um, and this is expressed as, you know, uh, eight ounces or the great with the grams in the parentheses or fluid ounces with the milliliters in parentheses. It's a requirement for us and then obviously for weights and measures. So ingredient statement, um, I mentioned this earlier, but a continuous list of each improved ingredient um, must be on the label and they are in descending order of predominance. So um, for example, if I have sweet potato biscuits, you know, sweet potato, flour, butter, um, maybe egg, I don't know, whatever you have in your recipe, you just do in descending order of the ingredients um, being added. So I showed you a few examples here on the side, like peanut butter, flour, butter, cinnamon. Maybe if you had a peanut butter treat, um, same thing for the sweet potato treat. And I mentioned this earlier, but just to clarify, CBD, hemp, and THC are not allowed in products with the guaranteed analysis. Um, and we're gonna go into a guaranteed analysis in just a minute, but just wanna make sure that's clear. If you have additional questions about that, please reach out to our office and we can we can talk about it. Um, you know, we want to make sure that everyone understands what our laws and regulations are. So label requirements, the guaranteed analysis. Um, this must be included with a, a, a heading saying guaranteed analysis. And you have to include these. These are the minimum requirements to be listed. So if you want to list more, you can, but this is just the minimal. So you have the crude protein minimum, crude fat minimum, crude fiber maximum, and then moisture is a maximum. And any other additional or voluntary guarantees can be listed thereafter in the appropriate format with, this, with the appropriate units. I have an example here to the side where you just see guaranteed analysis. And then what I have, I made this up, but the crude protein and I have you know fat, fiber, moisture listed below. Um, you know, for this information, there are, you can either send your product to a lab and have the product analyzed to give you this information, or if you can determine that from what ingredients you're using and you can calculate it yourself, you can also do that. So just want you to know that it is not necessarily required to send to a lab to get this information, but it may be the easiest um, option to do that. Okay, the other two requirements um, that we need on the label is the nutritional adequacy statement. Um, product is clearly identified on the front as a snack or treat. You don't necessarily have to write that, but if you just said kitty, crazy kitty crunchies, and you didn't say 
crazy, pretty crunchies to be fed as a snack or a snack or a treat or something like that in the in the um, brand name, then you're going to need to put that um, statement like feed as a snack or treat on uh, the label or feed intermittently or supplement feeding only. That's just for customer and consumer awareness. The manufacturer and guarantor is also needs to be listed on the product. Um, you can list it as just your business name, your city, state, um, zip. You can include a telephone number, include an email address. That's up to you. It's your preference. Um, obviously, we don't we don't require anyone to put their actual address on there, um, you know, exact address because of safety reasons. But we do require. Uh, the business name and the city and state and zip. So calorie content, this was the most recent addition to requirements for a, a pet food label. Um, you must include this um, for snacks, treats, supplements, any of them that are being fed to um, animals that have to have a statement of calorie content and meet the following. Um, so you can um, write it under it has to be distinct from the guaranteed analysis. So you have to actually have a separate, maybe a space or two, and then put calorie content. Um, you know, you have the calorie content of the product and then the calorie content of the calorie content of the entire package and then the calorie content per product. Um, I have an example on the next slide, but it is something that is now required. And to get this information, you would need protein, fat, fiber, moisture, and ash content. So if you have those things, you can calculate it. You can Google it online um, to calculate what the calorie content would be of your product. Okay, so here is just an example of a label. As you can tell, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, it just has to include this information um, because we are under consumer protection. This is part of it is protecting the consumer. You know, you have your name of your product. Um, as you can see, I have treat in the actual name, but I did list below to be fed um, as a snack or treat for small dogs. And so that talks about also what type of animal it needs to be. I have my ingredients that I included. Um, these are all the ingredients in my product. Then I have my guaranteed analysis, and then I show, you know, the minimum of protein and fat and the maximum for the fiber and moisture. And down below that separately, you can see that I have the calorie content ME, which is metabolizable energy, is listed for the whole product or the whole package. That's what I should be saying. And then the 25 kcals per, per treat is, you know, per um, sweet potato treat that I have in the package. And then lastly, I have my company name, ABC Treats, in Dogtown, Virginia. I should have included a zip code. Um, so that's my fault on that one. But you can see I have a um, email address for people to contact. You can put a phone number if you prefer that. You don't have to have either. And then lastly is that net weight that's required by weights and measures to have on that, on that um, label. So... You know, some people have pictures on their label, some people have additional information on their label, but these are just the basic pieces you have to have as required by our law. <clears throat> so also on labels, sometimes we see um, claims, and if you have a claim on your label, it has to be truthful. So um, sometimes you'll see whitens teeth, freshens breath. You know, we have to have the dental claim it needs to be included. Um, like the mechanism for the plaque and tartar removal. For example, chewing helps scrape away plaque and tartar. Um, another one would be low calorie dog treats. You know, must indicate in your feeding directions how to feed to meet claim. Um, and then lastly, cures cancer. Um, unless you can substantiate this, that would not be allowed. So you have to be able to substantiate your claim. So I showed this earlier, but I just kind of wanted to bring it back up. Just a good example um, of what a label can look like and that meets all the requirements we need. So just remember that it doesn't have to be super fancy. Um, lots of stuff on it just needs to cover those, those minimum requirements. And then I had a few questions that were asked of us uh, prior to our presentations. 
And I just wanted to go through these before I went back and looked in the um, question and answer. I've been trying to answer them as we went along. But one question was, are dehydrated or freeze-dried chicken feet allowed without a commercial kitchen? If this is for an animal food, yes, it is. You do not have to have a commercial kitchen to um, dehydrate or freeze-dry chicken feet as a, it's a pet treat. Um, as for pet food, have to be a certain, certain temperature. It really just depends on the product. So if it's a temperature controlled product, for example, like a frozen pup cup or some type of frozen product, then it has to be kept in a temperature that is to prevent any adulteration. Um, so if you go, if we were at a farmer's market and we were doing inspections and someone had a frozen pet treat and it was just laying out on the uh on a display table, and it wasn't kept um, on ice and under temperature, it's gonna melt. So that product's no longer gonna be applicable as a frozen pup cup. It's gonna be a liquid pup cup, I guess, at that point. Um, how do you go about starting an on-site dog food company? Now, I'm gonna drop my information in the chat, but please contact our program. We have some very helpful documents that we can send out um, uh, along with the for commercial feed application, we actually have a dog food or pet treat labeling guide. And, you know, this is, it is required to license and register your products regardless if you're selling at a farmer's market or if you want to sell at a storefront or if you want to sell online, like all these things still apply. Where would you find insurance for starting a dog food company? Actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm very sorry. I would reach out to maybe your insurance agent for help. Can you sell pet food or snacks at more than farmer's markets and wholesale without a commercial kitchen? Yes, you can definitely sell animal food, which is including pet treats or pet food and snacks, um, without a commercial kitchen at more than a farmer's market, but you are still required to license and if it's applicable, register your product. And then the last question I had was ground poultry as pet food, i.e. beef, pork, chicken, Yes, you can sell ground meat as a supplemental pet food. But once again, you just have to remember that it must be kept under conditions to prevent adulteration, so any spoilage or contamination. If we're at a, at a farmer's market and we open a cooler and the pet food is being held, it's ground beef or ground pork, and it's being held at like 60 degrees, it's obviously spoiling. And then now we consider that adulteration and we um, would stop sale that product. So those are the question, or that was my presentation um, about pet food. Let me see what's going on in the question. Oh yeah, you've got a lot of questions in the <laughs> chat. Okay, asked about something labeled as a pet supplement versus treat. So you can call it a pet supplement, you can call it a pet treat. Um, so what we consider as a pet treat is like supplemental feeding. So it's additional product. It's not a necess necessity um, to be a complete and balanced meal. Um, if you're looking to sell a pet treat, it would be considered a supplemental feeding is what we call it. Um, sometimes we've had people register products like a topper to go on top of uh, dog food and you know, they wanted to sell like a chicken broth topper or something like that. That's what we would consider supplemental along with the pet treat. Um, hopefully that is explains it um just so i understand no treats for pets can have hemp no products with a guaranteed analysis can have um thc cbd or hemp in them if you have questions please um additional questions please just contact us um but that's if anything has a guaranteed analysis on it is the way our law is written um and that i think addresses both uh the questions about the pet treats with hemp and pet treats with CBD. So are you saying that if a product, if a pet product does have a guaranteed analysis on it, it can contain CBD, hemp, or THC? No. If, if it has a guaranteed analysis, your protein, fat, fiber, it cannot have CBD, hemp, or THC in it. Um, okay. That is the way that our law has been written. Um, but people, but if people have additional questions about it, please contact us. Um, there's also the animal remedy law, which I don't really handle, 
um, but I can talk to them about that and that may have a different option for them. Um, there's no guaranteed analysis on that. It's active versus inactive. So just contact our program if you have questions about that. Thank you. Okay. I think the question about the market being a system has to I think this actually goes back to the hemp question from the from Lisa's presentation regarding hemp, whether a market would be if a vendor is illegally selling a product, would the market be liable? Or could the market also be in trouble with the law if they've allowed somebody in to that's selling a product that's not legal? Um I'm I I don't, I think that it would be the person selling it that would be who we would be discussing it with. I can't answer about everything because I don't know how the laws are written for the farmer's market and, and whatnot. But if we see product out there that is containing um, unapproved ingredients in it, as we would call it, then we would stop sale that product and we would be in discussion with the person selling it or guaranteeing it. And I know regarding... And, and we would have to check with law enforcement regarding the legality of, you know, a market manager allowing somebody to sell it in their business. But regarding liability insurance, it, you know, it is not, it, it is a market's responsibility to make sure that every vendor is compliant with all local and state regulations regarding your liability insurance. And so it is a liability issue for a market. Um if you are allowing anything to be sold that is not compliant with the law, but whether you could be arrested because somebody is selling, you know, hemp gummies, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. But anyway. Okay, let's see. Is there a specific point of contact to talk to someone about cooking pet food on site? Yes. Please just call, please contact me. I'll drop my information in the chat. And I know I think y'all are sending out um, information as well later, but you can contact me and I will put you in touch with, if I can answer the question with someone else in my program who can. Um, what are the labeling requirements for a vendor who sells pet treats only baked with fresh ingredients and not prepackaged? The treats are sold by the ounce and patron select flavors. So you would be considered wholesale for us. You would then be required to not register your product. You would still have to have a license, but you wouldn't have to be required to register the product, but you would be selling, um, we would consider you wholesale. So that means you would have to pay the $35 tonnage fee. And that form is what I went over earlier. For those who are selling their products prepackaged, they are exempt from that. They do not pay. Where if you're selling it wholesale, where someone picks it, and you put it in a bag and they take it home, that would be different. You would do, you would have to pay the tonnage fee. Um, you also still need to provide a label for them um, just to make sure that they understand what they're getting. And it also protects you as the um, guarantor of the product just because no one can come back and say, I didn't realize this had cinnamon. We'll just... I'm just trying to pick up, pick something and my dog can't eat it or my cat can't eat it or whatever. You know, they had that label and they were aware of it. Um, so that's why we do, we do ask people to provide that. If um, someone wants to sell bone broth specifically for dogs, the package needs to have the guaranteed analysis. If they want to sell the bone broth specifically for dogs and they're um, marketing this as a pet, food supplement is what we would call it, um, then yes, they're going to need to license and register with us, and they're going to have to have a guaranteed analysis on it. Basically, anything being ingested um, is what we would consider that, you know, the animal is going to consume it or the dog's going to consume it. So they are packaging that as a pet food supplemental feeding. Okay, requirements to sell farm produced dehydrated chicken liver, hearts, and chicken feet at the market. Do we need to send off the items for testing? Um, contact me if you can separately, because I just need to make sure that there's not an exemption to this. Um, there are a few exemptions for chews and stuff. I don't know if there is for the liver, hearts, and chicken feet. Um, so I wanna double check that before I give uh, a final answer. Requirements um, 
not labeling, just requirements. Okay, yes. I think that person was with the answer, the question before. So just please contact me and I will give you a final answer on that. Do I need a permit license for each flavor or formulation or does one cover all products that I produce? So we get this question a lot. If you are selling multi, multiple different flavors, you have to have those products registered because um, they're considered different products because they have different ingredients. Now, if you're selling... Um, different products like in different packaging sizes so maybe you have three um sweet potato treats in one i don't know six in another nine in the last one or something like that then we wouldn't require you to register each product you would just require it one time and it is a little confusing i know um i have a document that talks about that specifically and like sp separates it out so that's really helpful to review when you're trying to determine that we here also at Akamani's will help um, will help that if you if you reach out to us and give you an answer. Is that document available as a resource that we could have, or is that an internal document? Yes, it is for you. I will send it to you. I send it out to anyone who um, has questions about selling pet food and pet treats. It's just a helpful like guidance guide for the labeling and and what you need to do to register and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'll send it to you. I appreciate that. We'll put it on our resource page and sure. send all of the collateral materials for the conference. Okay. Looks like last question at the moment. I've seen the guarantee analysis labels with city, state, and zip code only for manufacturer and other labels with full address. I think I was told I could use only use the city and state if my address is public. Can you reconfirm? You could only use it city and state if your address was public. I'm sorry. I guess I'm not. I'm not really sure. Can you contact me separately so I can not quite understanding it. if you want to use your full address is maybe the question, but if it's public, you don't, you can't, I'm not sure. I'd have to double check on that. We typically suggest people not to use a full address just because of safety purposes. Um, but I would need to, if you can send me that email separately, I will double check on that. Are the label requirements different for pet food than they are under food safety? Yes, we have different labeling requirements than they do okay. um, in the food office. Um, and those were a lot of kind of what I went through and just showing like a simple um, okay. label. You know, some people have a lot of other things they want to put on there and just making sure those, if you do, it's truthful and, and making sure it's in the formulations that are required. But yes, we have different regulations or requirements per label. We went over the labeling and we had a lot of pictures of labels last week when we had food safety mm -hmm. talking about, you know, what the labels need to look like to sell at a farmer's market. So that's Yeah, and that was, um, you know, the, those label, the label I put up there and then in this document, it has examples too, but it just shows you like it doesn't, it has to have, I think there's like eight or nine things that are required. Those are just the minimum requirements. You don't have to do more if you don't want to. It's, it's, it's a personal um, decision, but those are the things that have to be on there. Okay. Yes. You do not have to put your full address. You can just put city, um, state, and I forgot the zip on mine, as you saw, but we just, we want the city and state. You do not need to have to, you do not have to put your full address on there. Hopefully that's answered the question finally. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, and you know, when you submit um, your your feed application with us with the payment, you also submit labels. If for some reason there was something that needs to be changed or um, whatnot, then our um, safety and compliance officer will be reaching out to you and they'll be discussing it. Um, we're not gonna just ignore it or decline it or anything like that. We're just gonna help you fix it so it's correct and meets the requirements um, that we have in our, our um, law. We have one more question, I believe. Okay. Um, 
I don't believe there's any exemption to a training treat versus just a, a pet treat, um, especially if it's packaged. Don't, I don't think that's a true statement. Yeah. And there's nothing that I'm aware of that says training treats would not, would be exempt from the requirement. Okay. The, you had mentioned that there were several things that were required on the label. Are they on your website or part of your application process? They're um, in our law, but um, I will send you that document to put on okay. your um in your resource library and it breaks it down better. That makes sense. Like it really just okay. focuses directly on them. Just like the presentation talked about those labeling requirements. That was kind of a big part. Um, just so everyone knows like what is needed on there. And I appreciate that you said that you will work with all of the vendors, um, the business owners on their label as um, Pam Miles Center Food Safety always says, please, before you invest money in printing labels, ask us if the label is correct so that we can, we're happy to work with you, show us a copy of it before you invest and have thousands printed and we will make sure that they are. A hundred percent agree. Um, please reach out to us and we can, um, you know, review it. And we do review all these before we license and register, but just before printing, just to be safe, because we don't want you to be out all that money either. Like that's not good for anyone. Um, so yes, contact our program and we can, um, with questions, if you have questions about that. Perfect. And I think, is that, um, do we have any other questions? I see a few more. Is someone said, how can we verify a vendor? If you're trying to verify as a farmer's market manager, if the company or the, um, the person is licensed and registered, you can reach out to us and we can double check for you. Um, and then if the product doesn't change ingredients when produced, but a different food coloring is used, does that change the analysis? Um, I can't imagine it would change the analysis for it. Um, if you're using the same exact name, but can you reach out to me just so I can double check on that question for you? Because food coloring, I'm not sure which one they're being used and if they are approved for pet food consumption. Perfect. Thank you. Any last questions? I'm going to go ahead and drop this stuff in the chat. I appreciate that. I was not able to, if you could capture those answers, that would be great. And the resource documents. Um, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank everybody for participating today. Thank you to our supporting partners for helping to make this event happen. We're going to follow up with an email that includes the links to the recordings of the presentations and the resources mentioned today. To receive proof of participation for the Food Safety Summit, please use the link in the chat to submit your request. Again, this was for last week's session. Uh, we also dropped the link for last week's session if you want to watch it. It is up on YouTube if you need to take the quiz so that you can get the certificate if you weren't able to participate live. That will be available at farmersmarketuniversity.org in the next two weeks. Um, after you do that, you will receive proof of participation. Um, Please join us on Thursday, this Thursday, April 11th, for the third day of the Food Safety Summit. Our speakers will be from Virginia Alcohol Beverage Control Authority and the Virginia Cooperative Extension. I want to thank you all um, again, and thank you especially to our presenters, our supporters, and our attendees. We hope to see you back here on Thursday. If there are no other questions or comments, we will um, adjourn the meeting and see you back here on Thursday. Thank you all.